знищили. Слава Україні! Ми переможемо! Це наша земля! Ми відреставруємо! Hello and welcome back to Watching Brief for the week of the 7th of March 2022. Uh, I suppose the beginning of March, actually, seeing as, as uh, uh, we were waiting on aspects of this week's watching brief for, uh, at the end of last week. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, regardless of how and when we're waiting and what we're waiting for, our watching brief continues. And I'm joined, as ever, by my amazing uh, colleague, Mr. Andy Brockman. Uh, good afternoon, Andy. Good afternoon, Mark. Good afternoon, viewer. Indeed, indeed. Uh, well, good and and also serious you know the the the, the events that we're going to be talking about in uh, this this week's watching brief um require a certain amount of sobriety and seriousness uh, and so um yeah we're not being too daft in the opening but we are going to start this watching brief though with uh first of all some exciting news about a ship having been discovered are we not that's right. It's a breaking news story. Uh, it, it actually, the story actually was released this morning uh, mm -hmm. in, in the UK. It is the uh, announcement that a research expedition has found the wreck of the Endurance, which mm. was a research ship that went to the, um, the Antarctic in 1915 mm -hmm. under the command of Sir Ernest Shackleton, famous British Antarctic explorer. Mm. And um, it was caught in the ice and sank in um, three kilometres of... Of, of water, um, mm -hmm. 10,000 feet in old money in, in the Weddell Sea. Um, it is a number of expeditions of, of, of look for the ship. Obviously, it's an iconic ship in terms of Antarctic exploration. Mm. Um, and um, it has been found um, by um, a team, including marine archaeologist Menson Bound. Um, also, uh, I understand that um, Dan Snow, the famous um, broadcaster is also in uh, televisions dan Campbell's. snow <laughs> yeah <laughs> yes um the the um the work has actually been done by a south african-based research vessel called the agrias 2 mm. um and um it's a, an exciting prospect and i suppose in in, in at one level um you know the, the, the ship's well known from photographs and uh, accounts of the time uh, and, and so on um but is it you know it, it is an, an an iconic find it is also uh, a find that almost complements the finding of hms Erebus and hms terra in mm. the arctic ocean um which was announced a few years ago and we're seeing the astonishing level of preservation of these wooden shipwrecks in deep cold water where there are no marine organisms that devour wood basically mm -hmm. um and in due course we may find similarly intact shipwrecks of other perhaps even rarer ship forms maybe ships that disappeared longer ago than the endurance um mm. that maybe survive in similar conditions in deep ocean mm. so maybe a, a, it's also a, a hopefully a, a harbinger of what might be to come in in, in maritime archaeology What's, what I find astonishing about this, it's almost like, you know, we, we grew up as kids with images of the, the sunken galleon, mm -hmm. where the diver can actually, you know, swim through to the captain's cabin and find the treasure chest. Um, <laughs> we see it in, you know, in, in films and in cartoons and so on. Yeah. And, and in fact, the level of preservation on these these ships in, 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 in deep, cold water um, and, and anoxic water mm -hmm. is... At that level, we you know we we also had the expedition in the Black Sea uh, a few years ago, which found the oldest I think it is identified shipwreck in deep water, uh, right. dating back to um, uh, hundreds of uh, uh, many years BC. So you know, maritime archaeology is a very exciting world to be in at the moment, and yeah. um, this is just the latest example of what can be done. It's also a very positive example as well. You know, when we're not for once uh talking about uh you know a company trying to monetize uh, a shipwreck necessarily you know um it's it, 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 it well well i mean okay there's a tv series attached to it presumably you know and yes and mr snow is there so okay it's not it's not entirely research for research's sake but then again i suppose actually if you're going to the antarctic you're going to have to uh fund it somehow so there's there'll be yeah but but it's, it's a positive development mm. though yeah uh, uh, yeah look you know, commercial archaeology is funded by 
commercial entities which have no interest really mm. in, they, they wouldn't be doing archaeology probably if they didn't have to no or at least many of them wouldn't no so you know i i think you know wherever the funding's come from from this you know it's it's been released there, there appears to be a type certainly the story appears to have broken with the times mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um and there may be other you know me, me, there's certain so that there appears to be there may well be media tie-ins you know that's part of the game yeah um uh, the, the fact is, that, you know, the, the, the work has been done and, and we haven't, as you say, we haven't had, um, you know, the CEO of uh, of a company suggesting that the, the you know, endurance was carrying, you know, uh, unregistered treasure when it sank. Exactly. Yeah. Um, which we have seen in the past. Yeah. Naming no names. <clears throat> Honestly. 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 <laughs> You're getting predictable, yes. Andy. You're getting predictable. Um, fair enough, fair enough. But, yeah. uh, other, other, com other commercial treasure hunting ent entities are available for you to sink your money into if you're really, really stupid. Indeed. There are there are lots of ways to sell your soul. Um, I'll leave that there. So uh, anyway, so... <laughs> so yes, that is... You might, you, you might say that, you might say that I couldn't possibly comment. <laughs> interesting news. We'll probably or may well return to this at some point. Ind um, indeed, yeah. indeed. Uh, but uh, now we move on to, again, uh, with bearing in mind the, uh, the 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 serious topic that we're also going to be talking about in this watching brief, we're going to move on to the, the, the appetizer, the light, happy, good, wholesome archaeology story that we that we aimed to balance the, that with um, by discussing. This is, this is the th this is the thing, dear. Yeah, we we do actually sometimes talk about archaeology and this is a wonderful piece of archaeology yeah. archaeology as opposed to what archaeologists are doing this week yeah um yes. <laughs> um and yeah this is the venus of of, uh, of villendorf it is a uh, roughly thirty thousand year old um uh, portable uh, art piece uh, one of a whole selection of so-called Venus figurines from um, from the Upper Paleolithic, which manifested across uh, the European continent and uh, and elsewhere, uh, and and for a long time, I mean, they were they were coined as Venus figurines because of classical education, basically in Europe. So people would would go, "Oh, this is the Venus of you know Venus de Milo, the Venus of Willendorf," mm. you know, this kind of thing. Uh, but but what they represent is uh, is interesting. It's always been intriguing, uh, and this one is arguably the most famous Venus. Uh, she's a squat, um, ch uh, chunky uh, female figure, um, possibly with um, uh, with well either a beaded cap, uh, a shell cap, or a tightly um, tightly uh, scrunched hairdo it almost looks like she's wearing a shower cap actually uh, and interestingly as well she's so famous that she turns up as an oversized statue in uh, in the second hellboy movie there's a there's an auction scene at the beginning of that film where there's this sort of i don't know 15 foot version of the venus but she is portable she's hand a handheld figure from around mm. about thirty thousand years ago uh, and this is news uh, that um based on new micro computed tomography scans with a resolution of uh, 11.5 microns um uh, analysis uh, can explain the origin as well as the choice of material and particular surface features of the statue the team is uh, based in vienna there's an austrian team uh, led by by the anthropologist Gerhard Weber, and um, it's 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 quite exciting because not only is the imagery and the imaging uh, a, a wonderful technique, but it, it's actually reinforcing uh, just how well travelled these Venus figurines were. They uh, one, one of the the one of the earliest things that the, that you that we learn about these things when you're studying. Um, prehistory is that they they kind of represent long distance trade at the very least or or long distance relationships because stuff has passed from person to person and um, anyway but, 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 but you know we're talking about about the stuff um uh more broadly there i mean what 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 what, what do you make of this particular piece of work andy well the reason um i it, this caught my eye and i suggested we, we talk about it this week is mm. it is a classical uh, a classic example of how you can say new things about old knowledge Mm. Um, what uh, Gerhard Weber and the, and the team have done is take a, an object that's been known since uh, 1908 um, when it was discovered in, in, in Willendorf in, in Lower Austria it, it, it takes its name from the place on the bank of the Danube where it was mm. found um, and it's as you say it's become iconic in both 
um, archaeological circles, but also in cultural circles. It can be referenced in something like Hellboy, as you said. Mm. Um, but a new technique uh, is high resolution computer tomography um, has enabled Weber and, and, and the team uh, to identify where it possibly originated. And it's mm. fascinating. Mm. It's possibly um, from near Lake Garda, the other side of the Southern Italian Alps. Mm -hmm. um, but um, the resolution is such that there's still some questions and it may even have an origin in um, topically and as we're going to be talking about in the second half of watching Brief Ukraine. Yeah. Um, so, but, but either way, as you <clears> say, <throat> it points up the fact that contrary to, again, what many people may have grown up with the idea that people in the past didn't move around much. Yeah. Um, it may well be that they did, or at least they passed artifacts from group to group, from civil, you know, from culture to culture. However, we, you know, we, we, we're, we're getting more resolution on these things all the time. Mm. And one of the reasons is modern analytical techniques like the one used here. Mm. Um, and it is just absolutely fascinating. You know, it, for me as a non-prehistorian, it, it was fascinating. And again, all credit to the team. It's been published um, in uh, na on nature.com Nature, yeah, uh, 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 yeah uh, uh, as, as an open access uh, open access report. Mm. Um, yeah. So it, any, I'd urge anyone to go and, 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 and read it just um, for some up to the minute description and background on an iconic archaeological object and i think for anyone interested in prehistory it's an absolute must read yeah i think so and it, it's interesting as well because specifically in the upper paleolithic this is from the gravatian culture so that's a tool culture yeah. that's identified um from around about that that thirty thousand year ago uh period mm -hmm. and uh it, it it represents um actually as uh as uh i think beba says here um people in the gravatian uh, looked for and inhabited favorable locations well that's that's okay fair enough you're not going to look for an, an inhabit an unfavorable location uh, when the climate or prey situation changed they moved on preferably along rivers um such a journey from uh near lake garda over the alps into europe and eventually into austria uh, could have taken generations potentially because mm. the thing to bear in mind as well is that this shows uh, and inc incidentally, tomography. Um, I think we 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 figured out when we put, first put this on the agenda is is a slicing up imagery, isn't it? So it's a bit like a, yeah. a, a cat scan or something. Where exactly? Can, it's, can, it's a cat. It's it's, it's 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 the same kind of technology that's used for uh, in in. in in medical research and, yeah. and, and diagnosis. Yeah. yeah. And this allowed a sort of comparative analysis of the, the material within the geology, the, the micro uh, formations, the crystals, the, the grit and the grit and the, um, and, and, and of granular. course, uh, uh, absolutely. Mm. And, and importantly for a very small and very precious object, it's non-invasive. Oh, well, so. absolutely. Yeah. 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 Precisely. Yeah. So, uh, so they're able to do a remarkable imaging. Um, but, but the, the, the block, or the stone might have been a block that was carried away from the site. It may not have been made on the site. It may have been made during its its transition from one place to another. Um, <clears throat> and also, crucially, um, we don't know necessarily if this actually represents a person or a an idea. I mean, she's she's so famous uh, partly because she represents such a voluptuous sort of fertility aspect potentially people often um ask whether this is potentially a, a you know a goddess a, a, a figurine um that, that again is a sort of echoed in in other venuses across 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 the continent um it may well have been a real life person and and actually there's a wonderful there's a really cool cartoon i saw a few years ago where um <laughs> where we had um two two images side by side the line drawing really really quite quite wonderful draftsmanship where you have uh this this thin um stone age person sort of like you know praying at the feet of this huge you know round wonderful um you know well-fed basically human being uh, uh sort of statue and then it flips to modern times where you have this huge round very well fed person with a baseball cap on uh bowing at the feet of a supermodel who is pencil thin <laughs> and looks as though she's been sort of stretched out like taffy so it's uh it, it also represents possibly the um 
And, and we see this anthropologically, actually, possibly the fact that that uh, fatness, large people, represented uh, bountiful uh, resource management, the ability to bring together food and 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 and, and resources you know to one place and to and to benefit from that so it may well have been actually just just the idea the notion of of plenty a sort of cornucopia being represented in this statue um but this this is where you can tell i'm, I'm a prehistorian um originally because i can i can waffle on <laughs> i can waffle on with very little evidence um uh, about almost anything um, just, just it's interesting though. Just, just a, a technical level, and uh -huh. you can come up with new information when you when reading up on something you haven't really read up on before. I'm very familiar with the image. Uh, yes. What I hadn't, re uh, what I hadn't realised until I read this paper, because again, because I'm not a prehistorian, mm -hmm. um, but the the Venus that we see now um, is not how she was found. Apparently, um, she appears to have been uh, painted red, possibly with a red ochre. Yeah. Uh, and people, again, uh, I, I, I've read enough about prehistory to know that red ochre appears to have been used in the um, in the Mesolithic, mm. uh, f possibly for ritual reasons. Mm. Mm. Um, and yep. certainly, it appears as a pig it appears as a pigment. Yeah. So you know, we're, we're dealing we're dealing with levels of decoration. You know, first of all, the object is created, and then it's decorated. Yeah. Uh, it, it's a bit like we you know we now know that, for example, you know, sculptures from classical antiquity mm. were almost invariably painted quite luridly in terms of what we might expect now in terms you know we, we've got this you know renaissance taste that, that, that we, we have the, you know, pristine stone yes. marblesque absolutely mm -hmm. uh, but here you know going right here going right back as far as we can possibly know at the moment in, in prehistory we've got this um ma making and decorating of sculptural objects it's fascinating yeah well actually <clears throat> uh, the red ochre aspect in prehistory it was often used in graves and we think possibly because uh, it, 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 it uh, it's a color that might have been connected with death or transition into the afterlife or it might just have looked as though it slightly reinvigorated the corpse during the funeral it might have just looked a bit more rosy cheeked as it were covered in red in life um but there's a there's a very famous uh, you, you've probably heard of the red lady of Paverland cave um, who was in fact a bloke yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So it was a, a, a an antiquarian, I think. Oh no, no, a geologist. Sorry, mm. who first mm. discovered it and then got together with some antiquarian mates, and they went, "Oh, this is a because uh, the cave was in a cliffside below a Roman camp," and they said, "Oh, this is clearly the burial of a courtesan who was servicing the camp above, and uh, you know, because she, she's got all this jewelry and stuff, and and she was called the Red Lady because of the red ochre that was on the bones." Um, but uh, yeah, no, it was it was a it was a it was a man from prehistory, not a, a woman from Roman times. Um, <clears throat> so um, there you go, folks. Solid archaeology. A good a good ten minutes or so, actually eighteen minutes, I suppose, if you count the uh, the Shackleton story as well. Um, and uh, and you know, don't don't say we don't do anything for you. So <laughs> so we have links links to those below. Uh, the Nature um, article is uh, is definitely well worth a read. Um, now, be, be, before we we dive into uh, into talking about uh, Ukraine and what's happening there, just want to highlight the link of the week this week. Uh, this is the, the Disasters Emergency Committee, uh, DEC uh, .org .uk is the link we're linking to, but there may well be uh, other regional variations on that. Just 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 you know, search for Disasters Emergency Committee if our link doesn't take you to where you need to go. Um, it is uh, a an organisation that are gathering funds. Um, you can donate to them. And the key facts are uh, that 18 million people are um, projected to be affected by the escalating conflict in the Ukraine and 4 million, 4 million people are expected to be displaced as fighting continues uh, with at least 2 million people having already fled their homes in Ukraine. Um, it says you can help supporting families fleeing this devastating conflict uh, donate now. So so that's our link of the week. Um, uh, absolutely. And can I ju just say there that is for, uh, that, that appeal is uh, the Disasters Emergency Committee is a long-standing uh, UK-based yeah. organisation. It's a, a committee that's run by, it's a consortium of the major NGO charities involved in uh, humanitarian relief. Uh, and it's a humanitarian appeal. It's nothing to do with the conflict. Or it's not supporting either side. It's trying to help people who are being displaced by the fighting. Yeah. So in that sense, it's not political. It's not religious. It's absolutely not it's humanitarian. No. Yeah, absolutely. 
Uh, <clears throat> so, um, where do we start? Uh, the, 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 fir the first link uh, that we have here, and I suppose this this is a good opportunity to to begin with 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 something that that we're almost like almost certain to see. And I have seen, in fact, in the archaeological community a little bit uh, from from mm -hmm. some people. Uh, is uh, with the statement that, for example, here UNESCO are deeply concerned about the fate of Ukraine cultural heritage sites. That it is possible to be concerned about culture, and also be concerned about people. So, so by talking about what we're talking about uh, in this watching brief, we're not, as we've just highlighted, dismissing the the actual plight of people, um, but rather, uh, as uh, I think incorrectly is assigned to Winston Churchill. The question is, uh, if you don't preserve culture and heritage, then what are people fighting for? Uh, people need to go back, be able to go back to, to their country when, as and when they can. And their country is characterized by these uh, works of art, historical places, monuments, and so on. Um, is UNESCO right to be deeply uh, concerned about this? Uh, I, I, saw, I saw someone... I think they were a bit irritated because of because of well, irritated is the wrong word. They were a bit angry, frankly, because of this conflict. And they said, if UNESCO cared so much, they'd send in they'd send in missiles. And I was like, I don't think UNESCO has an armored division. <laughs> but um, you know, that, uh, in all seriousness, is UNESCO correct right to be concerned? Um, because s some people are suggesting that that the Russians wouldn't want to destroy. Um, Ukrainian cultural artifacts because they see it as, you know, little Russia. What, what, what do you think? Right. I'd like to step back a minute and just um, put this in a little bit of context mm -hmm. and certainly put the discussion in a little bit of context. Mm -hmm. um, I think, f um, first of all, this sits in a an unfortunate um, line of potential and actual threats to local national cultures and actually international cultures as recognized, for example, by UNESCO with its World Heritage Sites. Mm, mm. Um, so just in the last 10 years or so, we've had threats to sites in Libya. Uh, we've had um, attacks on sites in Timbuktu and Mali. Mm -hmm. Um, we've had the first conviction of somebody for cultural war crimes uh, to do with the uh, uh, attacks on the, um, uh, the libraries of, of Timbuktu. Mm -hmm. um, UNESCO most has, hi has highlighted uh, encroachment on monuments in Mexico um, and in Angkor Wat as well. Yeah. Yes. I, I, yes. I, I mean, I'm thinking particularly of conflicts at the okay. moment. Obviously, okay. yeah. Um, uh, the, the latter two are, are, are although there are. Um, Tensions, in some cases, not, yeah. tensions and, and low-level civil conflicts, and for example, in, in involving drug cartels and so on mm. in Mexico. Um, they, uh, we're, we're not dealing with substantial civil war and wars between nations, as we're seeing in Ukraine. No. Um, most recently, obviously, people will be familiar with, with um, what happened uh, during the um, Syrian civil war um, with the um, so-called Islamic State, occupation of Palmyra and the destruction of, of parts of that World Heritage Site and, mm -hmm. and, and um, indeed the, so the murder of the archaeologist um, who was trying, uh, who, who was one of the curators there. Yes. Um, so the, uh, and, and with that physical destruction also comes trafficking and illegal export and um, illegal acquisition mm. um, for, for, for money. Um, so uh, and, and 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 so the international heritage community and UNESCO and other partners have had uh, you know a warning in recent years of what can happen in these kind of situations. Mm -hmm. And in fact, even before the current conflict broke out at the end of February, um, a, a report, um, uh, well, um, Ukraine and Russian occupied Crimea. Um, had already been identified as sites where there was illegal excavation, uh, there was there were traf there was trafficking of antiquities, the laundering of antiquities, and so on, mm -hmm. um, of, of multiple periods going from the the, the the classical Greek period. People might be aware of the you know the, the, the Greek colonies around the back Black Sea. Mm -hmm. um, again, one of which on on, on Russian occupied Crimea is a, is a World Heritage Site. Mm -hmm. um, 
uh, through um, the um, early Middle Ages, the uh, the Kievan Rus, um, which is part of the foundation mythology and history of modern Ukraine and modern Russia. Hmm. Um, and artifacts associated with that period right the way through to the Second World War and um, artifacts from the, uh, the, the, the the great battles of World War II that took place across the steppe and in, in Crimea around uh, the, the siege of uh, Sevastopol and, um, and, and so on. Um, so, you know, there, there's been warning of what's gone on before and there has been, and, and, and there it, it's been flagged up what might happen in that what what, what is available in in that particular area and just to finish on the on this um a, a report um that went to unesco in 24 um uh, um la, uh, sorry um last year but uh, referencing events that took place after the um russian occupation in 2014 mm. um has suggested that the um alleged that the russian federation has taken part in uh, uh, or has, uh, uh, has um, tried to suppress, for example, the history of the Korea, um, Crimean Tatars mm -hmm. um, with the idea of accenting the Russian aspects of Crimean history and to the extent of uh, authorising uh, both not just um, building, for example, in, in one case, a, a, a car park being built over a, uh, a Crimean Tatar cemetery, but also um, illegal excavations and the illegal export of material from Crimea, which under international law, uh, or by rights to belong to Ukraine, um, exporting that material to Russia. So, so, we, so know, we, we know we know that that one of the the driving forces behind what Mr. Putin would describe as a special military operation, um, mm -hmm. other people are describing as a war. Uh, one of the driving forces mm -hmm. behind this is is his conviction that Ukraine really has no right to exist in its own right. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, 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 this is an attempt to subsume uh, culturally Ukraine into into Russia um, and into into that Russian sphere, and and hence all of this sort of nibbling around the edges for so long is uh, has ended up uh, culturally nibbling around the edges, but also in terms of actually there's been violence happening before this war broke out as well. Um, mm. Of course, we must remember that, that, that Crimea was. Um, was taken a few years ago as well. Um, all of this has resulted in 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 what is therefore a clear and present danger to the the character of Ukrainian culture and heritage. Um, following uh, the adoption uh, by the United Nations General Assembly, said UNESCO on the third of March, twenty twenty two, of the resolution on aggression against Ukraine, and in light of the devastation, devastating escalation of violence, UNESCO is deeply concerned by developments in Ukraine and is working to assess damage across its spheres of competence, notably education, culture, heritage and information, and to implement emergency support actions. The UNGA resolution reaffirms the paramount importance of the UN Charter and the commitment to the sovereignty, independence, unity and territorial integrity of Ukraine, uh, within its internationally recognized borders and it demands that the russian federation immediately ceases its use of force against ukraine uh, and and within ukraine we there for example the museums association um no no sorry uh, rather sorry ap news rather is reporting that um at ukraine's largest museum there is a race on to protect uh uh, heritage. Uh, we have we see people uh, on a balcony in the, the the banner image for that article carrying um, an ornate uh, religious painting, uh, presumably into storage because below ground at the moment is where things are going to be safer uh, from from immediate physical damage, um, and uh, books, uh, documents, uh, sculpture, all sorts, all manner of stuff is currently being attempted to be saved. Uh, Museums Association. Um, has uh, is highlighting that mu the museum community is mobilizing to help colleagues in the Ukraine, uh, uh, sorry, in Ukraine rather. Uh, uh, but unhelpfully, though, some people are saying, "Well, just digitize it." Uh, I, I've seen some pieces. Just digit digitize this stuff, and then then it's safe. That's not. That's not. Digi did you digitize things as a backup, as a record, as a research tool? That this is not the same as saving uh, culture, and um, the 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 immediate. Danger is highlighted by uh, what appears to be um, the the already the burning down, for example, of uh, a museum of a museum 
um, uh, on the outskirts of Kiev. Um, supposedly, Russian forces uh, have burned down um, the museum, which is home to dozens of works by Ukrainian folk artist uh, Maria Primachenko or Primachenko. Um, there are this footage on Twitter of this uh, event. Uh, it is. From various angles, it has been filmed. As far as we can tell, the footage is legitimate. And that footage coincides with a tweet from the uh, Ministry for Foreign Affairs uh, in Ukraine, who state that as a result of the Russian invasion, around 25 works by the outstanding Ukrainian artist Maria Primachenko were burned. Uh, they say that paintings were stored in uh, the Ivankiv Museum in the Kiev region, uh, she created world-famous masterpieces, they tweet. Her special gift and talent captivated Pablo Picasso, and they include an image uh, of a uh, two-headed chicken, a painting from 1977. Uh, I wonder if they're going to turn that into an NFT. Anyway, um, <laughs> no, but in all seriousness, uh, yeah. the, the, the ministry is reporting on this because it is in their interests to log damage at best and to put to put the blame on Russia uh, at the very at the very least that, if one wants to be cynical so it, how, it, how do we, how do we pass this as viewers from afar right it, that that is an absolutely critical point look this is probably the worst political and military crisis in Europe since 1945 yeah and it is absolutely beholden on everybody who's involved and everybody who's observing this from afar to keep a cool head and not to just run away with the story. Mm. And taking the uh, Ivankov Museum story, which you've just been referencing, um, it looks like the museum was set on fire. It, it is possible that those paintings have been destroyed, but it's not been verified that those paintings have been destroyed. Mm -hmm. And it has certainly not been verified that the museum was targeted deliberately. No, no. So, yeah, to, to say, yeah, it, you know, war is messy, and this one is messier than most. The command and control on both sides is clearly being stretched to the absolute limit mm -hmm. because of the conditions. Mm -hmm. Uh and because of deliberate degrading of command and control again by both by both sides and over you know yeah so so cut to the chase um I, I think it is vitally important that anybody commenting on the heritage issues which are incredibly emotive and are quite understandably being highlighted but are also quite understandably potentially being played up as part of the information war Mm. that is taking place again on both sides um, we have to remember again both sides lie in wars for their own reasons and we're not going to know what actually happened until the guns stop firing and objective journalists and historians and writers are able to get in and actually analyze what's happened on the ground look there's an absolute case in point um we had a few uh, days ago uh, uh, after the um the, the um museum uh, story came out there was a missile attack on a television tower in Kiev, mm -hmm. um, and it was reported immediately that the uh, Babinyar memorial garden next door to the tv tower had been damaged and people immediately ran off with the idea that it was anti-semitic it was a deliberate attack um and and so on and so on uh, the ukrainians um, released footage of uh Vlad vladimir zelensky hearing that it had been targeted and he went oh that's russians for you so they used that immediately didn't they as a yeah yeah precisely mm. but the next day a um a, a freelance journalist called oskatagy uh who was an experienced war correspondent and is is working out of kiev at the moment as a freelance mm. visited the site and subsequently published a story on the jewish news yes. where he looked at what had actually happened and said yeah there is damage to uh there's, there's rubble scattered across parts of the babinyar memorial garden which of course is is, is incredibly sensitive it's a memorial to thirty six thousand ukrainian jewish people who were murdered by the nazis in 1941 it was the biggest mass shooting in the holocaust yes um so it's incredibly sensitive um but kataji said that from his observations it looked like collateral damage. The site hadn't been deliberately targeted. No, no. And that is absolutely critical. The thing is, the um, thing is, the thing is, though, the race is real. You know, the race that we mm. reference in the thumbnail for this video uh, to protect 
this culture, this heritage, and yes. and, and and all this other stuff yeah. is real. Collateral damage yeah. will happen, and therefore destruction will occur. Yeah, and absolutely. So, and so, is is this what you're? Is this is this what we what we need to do in terms of that passing? Is just saying, is separating out the physical effect and verifying the physical physical effect, and mm. maybe leaving the the machinations and the and the 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 fog leaving that to one side as much as possible because mm. w we are genuinely hopefully genuinely interested in the preservation of actual material culture and 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 people's heritage yes. for them to return to uh, but 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 also engaging in processes which if it hasn't stopped uh damage to culture in ukraine might act as a um a, a um a warning and a bar to people who might undertake similar activities in future to be at the very least more careful because um i think you know look ukraine has already brought a um a case in front of the international criminal court uh, accusing the russian federation of war crimes mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and since the hague convention of 1954 of which russia is a signatory um uh, the attack on cultural uh, except in very specific very prescribed circumstances the attack on cultural sites and cultural material is forbidden under international law it's a war crime if you do it well uh, do you recall but so, do you recall back in 2020 when um mr uh, mr when president former president trump threatened uh mm -hmm. literally threatened iranian cultural historical significant sites so yeah yes. th th this is it's a live issue, isn't it? Because because clearly, even so. though it's illegal, it, it will happen, and it can sometimes it can mm. happen deliberately. But but it's not for us to, to 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 decide if it's a deliberate thing or not yet. Not no, because we don't have the evidence. At the evidence moment, what what I know is happening because I've talked to people who are involved and I've been monitoring what's been what's being sent on. But there are people at a national level, at a governmental level, but also at a, 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 an individual level who are monitoring what's going on, who are looking at the social media feeds, who are looking at the video, who are looking at the, uh, the, the, the information that's coming out of Ukraine from both mm. sides, mm. And, uh, uh, and, and trying to get a handle on what, what, first of all, what's going on in the first place, and secondly, what may be down the line part of the case for war crimes at the International Criminal Court. And as I say, there is a precedent now for somebody actually being sent to prison for cultural war crimes, albeit mm -hmm. in, in, in Mali. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, for you know, the militaries of both sides um, and civilian, civilian authorities who are giving them instructions, there is a possibility that down the line, somebody, some of them, might end up in the dock in The Hague. And so it's really, really important to make sure that that evidence is both there and is not tainted by exaggeration or fabrication. Yeah, okay. And I think we can see how this process might be starting to be worked out um, through uh, a comment that I had from the media office at Historic England um, to do with a, uh, a story which I'm about to publish in the pipeline about Ukraine. Mm. Um, I asked um, Historic England about their, um, because they have a remit for heritage crime, um, whether they were all, uh, in consultation with other bodies about the potential for um, you know, uh, investigations arising from the, the conflict and what they mm -hmm. told me was that quote um, we're engaging with key national and international partners about how historic england can offer meaningful support now and in the future and we also know for example that the uh, the british armed forces now operate uh, they've been nicknamed the monuments men mm -hmm. but um there are there are members of the army um who are also uh, have background in heritage including at least one uh, quite well-known maritime archaeologist um who are uh, in, who, whose remit is the that the, the the Hague Convention 1954 and not uh, Britain's um, observing of it, but also investigations arising from it. Mm. So I think we can assume that there's a data gathering process going on. But I, th I think also having that comment from HE, it um, it leads to the question of how has the rest of the archaeological world, how the representative bodies in the archaeological world responded to this? And I think the response is, to put it kindly, patchy. Hmm. Well, but, yeah, because there are various ways in which in which this, this is affecting, obviously, primarily people. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, it, and, people it, and people are the most important thing. Yeah, in, in the first instance. So yeah. <clears throat> we're linking 
linking below to a story here where there's a quote you're on your own uh, african students stuck in ukraine seek refuge or escape route uh the 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 these are Africans who have been studying in Ukraine. Um, it's a very popular destination for particularly, I think, engineering and other degrees, um, partly because of uh, the affordability of, of degrees in Ukraine. They have international students yeah. from around, around the world. Yeah. And uh, it, it, it by no means is... I mean, obviously, we're highlighting this particular instance because these, these uh, students have had trouble crossing, for example, the Polish border. But, but, but you know, archaeologists, people studying related fields are going to be displaced by this. There's a direct yeah. um, connection here, not least as well in recent years, we've had uh, queries about uh, visas for archaeologists coming into the country. And also there's the opportunity now, uh, it, well, soon to be the opportunity apparently in, in the UK of a government sponsorship scheme where charities and uh, other institutions can can you know bring people into the country under uh under their 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 sponsorship um and and and, and, and for me this is where the word patchy does some very heavy lifting yeah. because i think um going within a few days of the outbreak of, of the crisis and it becoming apparent quite how big the displacement of human beings was going to be mm -hmm. um the um the, the the German Archaeological Institute and also the European Association of Archaeologists issued statements condemning what the Russian Federation was doing, what President Putin was doing. We, should, we mustn't say this is done, being done by Russia or Russians. It's being done by at the at the behest of President Putin. Um, but not just condemning what was being done uh, and and expressing solidarity with colleagues in Ukraine and mm. um, uh, 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 and, uh, and support for their attempts to save Ukrainian heritage. Um, they were also doing things like offering advice for colleagues who who felt they needed to cross borders to get away from the fighting. Um, they. Um, Little things like, for example, the EAA annual meeting was opened up to Ukrainian archaeologists uh, without membership or registration fees. Yeah. Um, uh, but also um, offering um, support for uh, you, you people from Ukraine who might need proof of employment or expertise. Um, and the, the EAA offered to help people in that situation. Um, they offered to help people fleeing Ukraine. In, I'm quoting here: "If you are fleeing Ukraine and in need of assistance in continuing your research at new institutions, please refer to a particular Twitter feed. Mm. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll link to these statements below. That's from, again from the European Association of Archaeologists. Mm -hmm. um, so we've seen proactive support at a level that the you know the community can offer." Um, and we've also seen, for example, you mentioned digital earlier, and I agree, you know, digital isn't a, a, um, a, a panacea, but at the same time, with so much uh, material kept online now and with educational sites in Ukraine coming under attack, um, there's a, um, a project called um, Sucho, or Saving Ukrainian Cultural Heritage Online, which has been set up by a group of uh, museum and heritage professionals uh, which is aimed at archiving um a, a, a data from uh, ukrainian websites and and, and and archives um that's again that that's a sort of a, a bottom-up initiative um i think what some people will find disappointing is that at the time of writing and it's something i've been looking at or at the time of, of, of we're recording this rather um the um the response from the main representative bodies in Britain, and I'm not talking about HE here, we've, we've heard what HE said, Historic mm -hmm. England said, um, but uh, I, I checked just before we started recording and neither the Council for British Archaeology, the Chartered Institute for Archaeologists, nor the Federation of Archaeological Managers and Employers, which are the three main representative bodies in, in UK archaeology, have said even have even acknowledged that the conflict is going on. Mm. Now there have been notable exceptions. The British Academy has issued a statement condemning the invasion and, and, and expressing support for uh, cultural uh, people in, in Ukraine, as have the Society of Antiquaries. But mm. the main representative bodies have said nothing, and I think there will be people arguing, arguing, is that good enough? Well, it 
Yeah, uh, and also, I mean, for example, with there's a link uh, we're putting below to a tweet from the Science Museum. Uh, in light of distressing events in Ukraine, we have decided not to proceed with our upcoming exhibition at the Railway Museum uh, and at the, the Science Museum called Trans Siberian: The World's Longest Railway. So, so <laughs> you know, the, 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 we're not we're not asking people to to move out of a space that hasn't already been established by other. Yeah comparable organizations and colleagues mm. uh I, 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 and safer for example deal with things like pro professional ethics yes which well, you know yeah. heritage protect you know uh, protection uh, heritage protection being at the core of that <sighs> yeah yeah and, and uh, you know I, I i hate to bring it back to what is in what is becoming a bit of a um a, a touchstone for watching brief uh but but my question would be how serious how serious do you want to be, CIFA, CBA, fame, about your roles? How serious do you want to be taken in your roles? How seriously do you want uh, fellow archaeologists to consider uh, the value of being members of your organisations? When, for example, on Twitter, across Twitter, uh, most of my uh, my colleagues, most of your colleagues, I'm sure most people, you know, obviously we move in very similar circles, have at least acknowledged it, or, for example, they've put the Ukrainian flag on their profile. You know, it, it, this is something that the archaeologists and heritage professionals care about. Where is yeah. the leadership? Look, let, let me take um, FAME, Federation of Archaeological Managers and Employers, as an example. Hmm. Um, now, you mentioned visas in the Home Office just now. Um, it was suggested by the Home Office that there will be a sponsorship scheme enabling companies mm -hmm. and charities, mm -hmm. as well as individuals, to bring... Ukrainians to the UK mm -hmm. in the current circumstances. Mm -hmm. The home the, the Home Office is not waiving visas like the rest of the like the European Union is. No. Um, it's insisting on, on on visa applications and so on. But companies and individuals can sponsor Ukrainians to mm -hmm. come to the UK. Mm -hmm. um, I asked Fame if it was if it had any had any dialogue with the Home Office about uh, uh, or its members about taking part in such a visa scheme to sponsor Ukrainian archaeologists. Mm. They have not replied. No. No. And and actually, you cc'd me in on at least six, I think, emails that you sent out um, yes. ahead of this watching brief a couple of days ago. And yes. as far as I can tell, no one really has responded. Except uh, Historic England. Except Historic England. And uh, yeah. that, it sucks. It just sucks. And, and the thing is, they don't have to respond to us. They really don't have to respond to us. They, ca they can just tweet. Just put out a message. Say something. Be be something, for, f for flip's sake. Um, <laughs> um, and this is where, again, the underscore is, this is about the people. This, you know, we are uh, archaeologists. This is an archaeological uh, video slash podcast. Vodcast, whatever the terminology is. Um, so we have talked about the, the the heritage and the risk to culture, which is being highlighted by UNESCO and others on the ground in, in Ukraine. Mm. But but we also want to see our our sector actually doing something because it is directly connected to to these events. And as I say, if the Science Museum can cancel an exhibition on the Siberian uh, Trans Siberian Railway, I'm sure I'm sure we should expect something. Uh, anyway, I'm going to stop rambling about that now. Um, no. Any final words, Andy, before we, we tease we tease uh, another watching brief coming this week, in fact? <laughs> yes. Uh, look, um, I think, as I say, it is a rapidly developing situation. Yeah. It is a very dangerous situation. Mm -hmm. um, there are one or two possibly optimistic signs. For example, it's reported that the Ukraine foreign minister and Russian foreign minister Sergei Lavrov are meeting in Turkey tomorrow. Um there have been attempts which appear to be slightly more successful today to uh, open up um, corridors for civilians to leave some of the worst affected uh, areas that are under uh, current military attack. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, um, you know, everything you, know, you mentioned the fog of war earlier. Um, it's, uh, I think, you know, we should hope for the best, but expect the worst uh, or expect it to become worse. Uh, before it becomes better and um as i say uh, very you know as individuals we can't do much apart from maybe you know donate a few quid to one of the uh one of the ngos who are supporting ukrainian people 
Um, and, uh, and others, you know, who are caught up in the conflict, but it's primarily Ukrainian people at the moment. Mm. Um, and, um, but then there are things that we can do as a sector. And there are certainly things that our governmental bodies can do to mitigate the situation. Let's hope they're doing them. Hope. Yeah, hope. Speaking of going from uh, from bad to worse before things get better, um, uh, uh, tomorrow, in fact, we're going to be filming uh, an interview with uh, Dr. David Petz of Durham University. Um, it'll probably come up on, on uh, it'll probably go live on YouTube, at least, on Friday, um, where we're going to be discussing the state of the ucu strikes i think the latest batch of strikes has just come to an end um but uh, but there are more slated uh, in in the coming days um the reason for the strikes uh and what the future looks like for higher education professionals uh, and also actually we're going to be if we can i'm not sure if we tied this down have we andy um tr uh, looking in on either this week or soon um people at sheffield again just to see what's happening there because the the struggle yeah. is not over um professor uh, umberto arborella continues to be certainly outspoken on on what's happening and has absolutely happened. Um, but also other departments and other other academics and other students at Sheffield are concerned, and this is all tied up with also some of these UCU um, strikes as well. So ab ab absolutely, the disputes are being rolled in together, and 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 in fact, uh, there are fresh actions. Like for example, there's an increasing number of academics who are withdrawing from uh, voluntary work and workers' external examiners and that kind of thing, which is, uh, if it continues at the rate it's going to, could have a significant impact. So hopefully, that's one of the things that we're going to be discussing. Yeah, yeah, I've been retweeting lots of those uh, those statements actually just to you know signal boost um so yeah so look forward to that this is going to be a, a double watching brief week ironically enough on a, on a, during a week when mrs soup is off work and apparently i'm meant to be follow, trying to follow some sort some sort of suit <laughs> but i have i've actually uh, i need to get better at taking time off don't i andy um uh, but but then again, this is a week when we couldn't. This is this, this has been an important. That, that's the reason why. why anyway, 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 uh, we'll see you guys later this week. Thank you for watching. Um, do message us if there's anything that you think that, that we should know about what we talked about today. If there's any information or any specifics that you think that we might have missed or we, we might want to know uh, to, to report on in the near future, the email is below. Andy's DMs are open on Twitter. You can message me in various ways. Uh, and uh, until next time, take care. Bye bye. Bye bye. Нищили. Слава Україні. Ми переможемо. Це наша земля. Ми відреставруємо. Ми все